We were smuggling alcohol and cigarettes back into the country. We used to drive to Spain all the time, and I used to I used to put a breeze block on the accelerator to find some girls' knickers. It was <laughs> tied to the tied the steering wheel as my own original cruise control, and I'd go in the back and start cooking. <laughs> They used to put us in stunt planes, jet boats, bungees, yeah. you know, the world. All on a freebie. Paying us to go yeah. there and, and doing it. So we had such a good time. And I had a summer of love after this split. Actually, she was voted FHM sexiest woman in Britain. Straight away, started having kids and stuff, and it was fantastic. We got divorced. I had depression after the, the divorce. As a separated parent, it's, it's very difficult, especially for the men yeah. that we lose our children. You know, it's been a major event in my life, losing my children. Why did you split up? Guy, welcome to the show, mate. Thanks so much. <laughs> Finally made it. I know, and it's, it's amazing to be sat here opposite you after watching so many of your shows, especially recently. I've just been like watching them all. Yeah, fantastic. In fact, in fact you might as well just stop watching this one now. Just <laughs> go to the Sean Atwood one. It's so much better than this one. It was so good, wasn't good, it? Good, wasn't it? Oh, my goodness, what yeah. a life. That we've was had, hilarious. Uh, we've had some mad ones on. But let's roll all the way back. Mm -hmm. um, where did you grow up, and how did you become an international globetrotting windsurfer? Well, rolling all the way back... Um, Let's go back a couple of generations. My my ancestors, or whatever they are, my, they, they all lived in Poole, and they were all seafarers from Poole. And I was born in Poole, and I've you know essentially become a seafarer. So um, my great grandfather he drowned on the Titanic, um, but he managed to get his daughter uh, to the uh, to the rescue boats super quick. He was one of the first up on deck. Got her on the rescue boats, and um, so she lived on. We've got all her handwritten Brilliant. story of that event. Um, my grandfather lived here, and he was in the sea a lot. And then my dad was born in Poole. And my dad um, and my mum, of course, are largely responsible for me and what's happened in my life. Um, they had extraordinary lives themselves. They lived in Africa. My father, he, he was born in Poole, and um, he, like any wartime baby had, a, or wartime child had a, you know, struggled childhood, but he had it particularly bad. I won't go into any detail, but his was rough as hell. And eventually he joined the Navy at the age of 13 or 14 up in Scotland. And uh, it was rough times, lots of people dying around them and stuff like that. And he, But he, because he joined the Navy so early, he then, um, by the time he was like 21, he was driving an Aston Martin. He was pulling up on, uh, on the, at the Admiralty in London, which is uh, mm. Horse Guards Parade, as we know it. If you can imagine driving mm. in there mm. these days, of course, it wouldn't happen. He had thousands of women working for him, and he'd already was on a good, eventful life. But then he moved to Africa, and um, he eventually became a SF assassin or trained SF assassin to to set him up to be the personal bodyguard for President Kaunda. Mm. So that's what he did, and he always walked around with a gun, never on safety. Um, so he, wherever Kawanda went, he went, and he, in fact, set up all the security for Zambia as well. He wasn't just the bodyguard, he was in charge of all the security, set the country up, basically. Um, so he was an adventurous guy, mm -hmm. and so then they lived in Jamaica, and then I was conceived in Jamaica. My mum, who was like a third generation living in Africa, um, they met there, and then, yeah, they moved to Jamaica. And uh, when I was conceived in Jamaica, they moved back to Poole. They mm. did the full circle. He came back to Poole. He thought, you know, great place to raise children. I did the same. I traveled around. I moved back to Poole. Dodge, you've moved here mm. um, with kids. You know, it is a fantastic place. Best place, best place in the world, I think. It's definitely one of them. I mean, I've seen a few good ones. Yeah. But uh, this is right up it there. It is, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, Don't tell too many people. If you're listening, it's not that good, by no, the way. It's rubbish, especially <laughs> today. <laughs> uh, no, and um, so, so that's how they got back to Poole uh, after their eventful lives. Um, sadly, he passed away a couple of years ago. My mum's still going strong. She's here and she's lovely and yeah. she'll be listening to this. Yeah. But they were adventurous people. And so they put me and my brother through our paces when we were kids. And um, we were sailing across the channels and things, the English Channel stuff like this in storms. We were in the water every day, thrown around at sea and, you know, made to in a military yeah. <laughs> kind of way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so I had that in me from a young age. And as a kid around here, you know, this, the sea and the yacht clubs are really mm. accessible. And when I was a kid growing up, I was at these places. And then this sport called windsurfing came out. And what year roughly are we talking here? 
let's say, I mean, windsurfing came out in the very end of the 70s, early yeah. 80s. And I got my eyes on it when I was 13 and about 1983. And yeah. I was like, that's the sport. Yeah. And at the same time, you know, I was just bored out of my skull at school. They were trying to teach me logarithms. Do you remember that? Did I, you ever get I taught know. logarithms? What a bunch of wankers. Yeah. They were trying to teach me that. And I was just like, there's no fucking yeah. way. I mean, it like gonna, algebra, is it? It was worse than algebra. Okay. Yeah, Brutal. it was even worse. Yeah. And um, I was like, there's no way I'm ever going to need this in my life. And I was, I sort of stopped school then. And at the same time, this windsurfing thing was happening. And, and I just started doing that. And although I wasn't thrown out of school then, my, my, I wasn't getting on well. So then um, there's, you know, there's some amazing schools near here. Yeah. And, and my parents got me an interview with this school called Bryanston. Mm. Very nice school. Yeah. And mm. I got a double scholarship to go there. I got an art scholarship and I got a sports scholarship. And they let me in. Yeah. And so I was packed off into this boarding school. I they let they let you in because your old man's gone here. Go, there's thirty grand a year or whatever. Well, no, because he wasn't. No, no, no. He didn't have any money back then. He <laughs> made some money eventually. Okay, yeah. But no, no, he didn't have any money back Lovely then. Lovely really. school though. Amazing. Yeah. So, so they got him because of the discount on the yeah. scholarship. Yeah. So I went there straight from a state school, and I was, you know, like a new romantic early eighties kid <laughs> with a quiff and you know, my sweater tucked in, like, an, <laughs> and I go to this place, and they're all like these hardcore boys who've been in these schools for years yeah. and knew, knew the system. They're different, and so I tried you know, fitting in best I could. I remember crying there the first night. I was in this lonely dorm, didn't know anyone. And I didn't start the school at the same time as anyone else. I was a year or two late. But this school, there's no school uniform. Yeah. Sport is epic. Yeah. Art is epic. And it's mixed. So yeah. there's chicks everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's so ridiculous. Win -win it's there. not a school. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, and so I had two years there. Yeah. And, and um, that helped with my sport, I think, because we were with a lot of... Uh, other kind of elite athletes yeah. at the time and they were pushing us and pushing us and at the same time I was doing well in windsurfing and the few weekends I'd get out of the school and um, I was competing in windsurfing from an early age and joined the British youth racing team and started traveling the world with them and I got thrown out of that school in the end. Mm. And What for? Uh, just I, I had to fess up because my mates had been caught and someone had vandalized one of the teacher's motorbikes mm. and I had to just fess up and say it wasn't them it was some kids from town mm. and in doing so incriminating myself but it wasn't just that it was a long series of events where various girls and various you know <laughs> nights and things like this um, and just I wasn't really doing any work I didn't see academic study as uh, something for me I mean one time we were coming back in the coach's bus and we got busted well, the coach got busted, unfortunately, because we were smuggling alcohol and cigarettes back into the country. Yeah. It was our little racket yeah, going, yeah, yeah. you know, because <laughs> back then it was illegal. Yeah. You couldn't do it. And anyway, we were underage and all that. So, yeah, we were <laughs> busted. We pulled into the customs room. And as the customs officer sort of just turned round to sit down, Adam pulled a bag of weed out of his pocket <laughs> and quickly shoved it behind the bookcase behind it, looked back as though nothing had happened. And the coach is looking at us, going, what the fuck? As if this could get any worse. There's drugs now as well. Is it actually a mullet? Uh, no. No, it's really. not. Let's have a look. Lift up the headphones. Oh, it's not a mullet, is it? No, no, no. no it might look like one. If it looks like a mullet, I better pull it back. <laughs> well, it's like Chrissy Waddle then. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. Yeah. No. I, it could be worse. Yeah. So that was that. And then, yeah, and then they, I, I represented Britain going to the Youth World Championships, the Youth World Championships, mm. and um, and only one guy could go. Mm. So I went, and they made. They said you can only go if you have a haircut. And at the time, I had these tram lines and spikes yeah. and mullet and yeah. crazy <laughs> shit going on. And uh, so I didn't cut my hair again. I rebelled against it. I didn't cut my hair for like another 10 years. So I used to have long hair. Really? This is all going back to your question. Yeah, yeah. Do I always had long hair yeah. or something? So I used to have long hair and I cut it all off. And, so what was the biggest attraction for you in the sport? When you actually said, right, I've left school now. I'm free. What was your, what was your end game? Was it like to travel the world with this sport? Or was it to represent your country? Was it to earn money? To be honest with you, there wasn't an end game at all. It was just the attraction of being the freedom of the sport itself. It's 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 an incredibly tough sport. I'd go so far as to say it's the toughest sport in the world. I can explain why. Um, but toughest the, as in as in it's fucking hardcore, man. It's it's like so difficult. How many windsurfers do you know? You. Yeah. So. <laughs> and, uh, and 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 that's it because it's yeah. too fucking hard. It's so hard to learn. Like it's easy. Well, it's hard to, to learn. It's a ball lake. Yeah. Because you're trying to pull. I've tried it a few times. I think, oh, what a ball. It, mm. You can pull your back out. You know mm -hmm. you're pulling up on the... Mm -hmm. And that's just the beginning stage. So yeah. that, that bit's the easy bit. It's like super easy to learn. Yeah. But to master it, to, to be able to, on a strong wind like today out there, mm. 
to go out into the sea, which is just moving all over the place. Yeah. You know, the sea doesn't stay still like on a driving a go-kart or yeah. a car. Yeah. The sea is moving everywhere. So your ground is being pulled from underneath you, especially on a stormy day, and there's waves smashing you around, mm. and then the wind's blowing you all over the place, and you've got to try and yeah. get something under control. There. It's incredibly difficult. And when you launch, especially on the sort of modern gear that we use at the yeah. high end of the sport, when you launch, there is no off switch. If you back off at all or think about anything else, you wipe out. Right, okay. There's no off switch. And I've played loads of other sports. And, you know, you obviously you come from rugby. So mm. rugby is a fucking mm. epic sport. Mm. Full hardcore, loads of contact, loads yeah. of action, loads of thinking, lots of tactics. But every time the whistle goes, you can breathe. Yeah. And you just have a rest. You have a regroup, yeah. reposition, have a quick chat, work everything out, mm. get your orientation right, line up, whatever you do. And when something, you never get a whistle. It's never off. I haven't it thought about full it like on. That. Yeah. So the only sport I've done that came even close was boxing. Yeah. And for three minutes, it's, you know, it's, excuse the pun, but it's in your face. Yeah. And you, you, you cannot take your mind off it for a second until the bell goes. Yeah. Uh, and then you get a minute off or whatever. The winter, you don't get that time off. Mm. It is nonstop in your face and it's hardcore and you can drown. Yeah. <laughs> or you can get hurt, but not too badly. Yeah. So as you were progressing from 18 to say 30, what was what was your journey around those, that sort of that decade there, mm. sort of 20 to 30 year old? Well, from the age of until I was 18, I was supported by the British sailing team mm. as their youth representative. But after that, we had to seek professional sponsorship, and that in the time came quite easily. In fact, um, one of my main sponsors back then was Animal. Mm. Um, maybe based you've heard pool. of the brand Animal based mm. in Poole. Oh, my yeah. mates set it up. Yeah, was yeah, it? They set it up in 1987. In fact, Nigel, I, I really recommend him as coming on your podcast because he has definitely had an eventful has life. He? Absolutely. Like, you know, more on that later. But um, so Animal was set up here, a couple of mates of mine above the windsurfing shop. Yeah. And as they expanded, I was their first ever sponsored rider. So they became a sponsor helping fund me around the world uh, following the professional world tour and following other events as well. You know, like Formula One, that's mm. the elite mm. end of car racing. Mm. Now, I did a bit of that, quite a lot of that. I did a few years of that, but I never won that. Mm. But um, I couldn't even get in the top 30 in that, really. Yeah. That was super tough. But to even get a place at those events, you had to win or be top three in other world championships, just like you do in Formula One. You've yeah. got to earn your right yeah. to get in that car. And so all those other events I was doing, and I, I was second in a heap of those. So um, with all that experience, yeah, I, I sort of turned professional. Um, at the time, back then, windsurfing was so big in England even that I could earn a living just living in my van, mm. like a proper beach van it was. I had it for about 11 years. Did you? Yeah, fuck, I still have nightmares about <laughs> it. Because it wasn't insured. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, the wheels were falling off. I bet off. some stories in that van. In there. Oh, man, man. We used to drive to Spain all the time, and I used to, on those open Spanish roads, yeah. <laughs> I used to put a breeze block on the accelerator and then get into the back of the van with some elastic, I found some girls' knickers it was, <laughs> tied to the tied the steering wheel as my own original cruise control. And I'd go in the back and start cooking. <laughs> so you just walk through and you occasionally make sure you're going in the right direction, give a little tweak. <laughs> the van was legendary. It was legendary. A lot of people got the stories of that van. But <laughs> was it a VW? It was an yeah. old Mercedes 508. Was it? And I loved it. It was Color? my home, whitish, grayish. Uh, I eventually drew waves down the side of it yeah. and stuff like that. It was cool, but it went around the world and mm. um, we had some huge parties. And when you, when you were traveling around the mm. world, when did you really start traveling? Like you were based in Pool here. When were you like, you know what, I'm actually going to get the bug for this. I yeah. need to go to all the countries, the Hawaii's, the Americas, the Californias. Mm. And when were you st really got the bug for that? Well, I think perhaps some of that came from that school I went to because it was so international that it naturally sort of made it comfortable to be with people from all over the world. You know, it became a part of my life. In fact, when COVID happened the other day, um, that was the first time since I was 17 years old that I spent more than two months in one country. Is that right? Yeah, in whatever that is. How old are you today? 21. Like <laughs> 52. 52. Yeah. And so you've just been moving around the world surfing non -stop. and having fun non-stop it's been a party since 17 years old non-stop <laughs> i can see you've had oh, plenty of parties <laughs> <laughs> i got that switch <laughs> yeah. so give me some my teeth are all there give too. me some uh, you're looking very well for your 50s by all the right, way thank guy. You, very thank well you. occupational hazard you know i get tan i stay fit yeah. i eat healthy yeah i you know i do a lot of fun stuff to have parties and everything but yeah. you know I, I eat healthy and i is there, give, give me some examples of countries that you've been to 
and uh, windsurfed in or kite surfed or foil surfed or yeah. all the other surfing there are out there. Yeah, well, you've done yeah. it kind of all, really. I didn't do much kiting, but anyway, um, I've been to Australia probably more times than I can remember now, since 1997-ish. Hawaii, about 20 years running. Morocco, 15 years running. Brazil, the last 12, 13, 14 years. Um, Foot of Ventura, I used to sleep on the beach there when I was 17. And uh, and then I've got a lovely house there now, which I frequent. So there pretty much every year. Um, Spain, I used to live in Spain and Tarifa and Italy and Lake Garda. And, but Venezuela, New Zealand, New Zealand was a great trip. That was, I think it was four months. We bought a Mazda 323 when I got there, when we got there. And we took all the seats out the back and that was our part home. We stayed in other places too, but we traveled around and that was just such yeah. a good trip. Yeah, so... Um, I mean, uh, you want the list? The list is like I mean, 40 countries strong I'm or something. Carry on. Oh, Puerto Rico, Barbados, Venezuela, Los Rocas, Aruba, loads of the Caribbean. Um, and I love the Caribbean so I much. love the Caribbean. Yeah, it's great. That's it's, like a second home for me. Is it? Mm. Good. And, and I mean, it's Barbados, right? Barbados, yeah, yeah. I, I adore Barbados. Yeah, I mean, Barbados is a whole country. Yeah. It's actually a country. Yeah. So they've got their own chains yeah, and absolutely. all these things. And, yeah. 300,000 uh, people. Is that all? It's mm. about the size of Pool, it's Bournemouth, Bournemouth right? exactly. exactly. And um yeah, so I love the Caribbean, and I've had yeah, I've been to some nice places like Los Roques. Is this where's uh, that? That is off the Venezuelan coast. It's a national park, and when we were windsurfing there, wow! Well, I mean, I've never seen sea life quite like that. So we were windsurfing along, and in front of us there was permanently fish jumping. Permanently. Really? I mean, and not always jumping. Sometimes just under the board, yeah. but permanently for hours on hours. It wasn't like we see loads of sea life, whales and sharks and all sorts. I got plenty of stories about those, but in Los Roques, it was just barracudas and fish everywhere all the time. It was like a fish soup. Barracudas, they're nasty things as well. Yeah, they can be. Yeah. yeah, my yeah. mate got bitten the other day actually on his leg, I think. Yeah, so, I've yeah. caught one fishing before and that was a nasty thing to bring in. Yeah, yeah, put it back. Mm. So um, yeah, and Australia heaps, and where I go in Australia is incredible. One of the, one of the places there, Nalu, um, I don't know if you've been to Australia, but yeah. for the listeners, uh, Western Australia is about the size of the rest of the world put together. Yeah. It's huge. Yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah. like bigger yeah. than yeah. France and yeah. Spain and yeah. Portugal, everything put together. Yeah. But there's only two million or two and a half million people there. And most of them live in Perth. So there's only about a million people scattered around. And almost all of them are south of Perth. When I go to Australia, I organize this event up in Nalu, which is this hell reef full of fucking sharks and whales. Really? And... Um, we drive north from Perth, and it's about 13 hours drive north. There is no one for about two or three hours around. The last two or three hours is just driving down these sandy tracks. Mm. But I organized this event there where we took all the food in, we took chefs in, we took everything in, all the drinks, all the booze, everything to last like 10 guys living in the desert, basically, by the water. Shark, we, like, we have all this all this first aid kit for sharks, sap phones, everything to get the hell out of there if there's trouble. And um, yeah, driving there, I remember one time we drove there and apart from going through the towns, we didn't see a single car on mm. the road for 13 hours. Mm. How nuts is that? Mm, it's so it's remote. So that's a good part of Australia we go to, but I've been all over with Melbourne and Sydney mm. and so on. And I remember driving down from Ayers Rock, <clears throat> sorry, from Darwin down to Ayers Rock, uh -huh. and just no one around for hours and days apart from these massive road trains. Remember the road trains oh, that come past? Oh, God, the one nearly killed My, us. Same, yeah. same. Like a road train. Imagine a truck, but it's a it's, it's like 200 metres long yeah, coming towards you. Yeah, three long articulated yeah, crazy. Thing. We actually oh. broke down in the middle of the, in the, middle of the uh, outback as well. Oh, we, had to, we had to hike in <coughs> and stayed in this, I, I hiked in, stayed in this local boozer in the middle of the outback where it was just hillbillies yeah. for seven days while our fans <laughs> getting thing. And it, it was just, it was the worst thing ever. <laughs> Three English lads you know, on rugby tour, after I finished our rugby tour. But anyway, um, so why did you choose, why do you choose Australia? Why did you choose the place where it's shark infested? Did it did not go through your mind, hold on a minute, there's loads of sharks out there, I could actually get my leg bit enough right now. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Was that part of the buzz? It's not really part of the buzz. We're all a bit concerned about sharks, but fortunately, windsurfing, it doesn't. They don't normally get us. We see them a lot, um, but we're making a lot of noise when we're windsurfing, mm. bouncing along on the surface like this, bang, 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 and then we, if we fall off, <coughs> yeah. You imagine being a little sharky underneath, a huge splash. 
they'd shit themselves. Yeah, but surely, like you see on the <clears> on the on the programs, is there's a board there, and your arms are out that way, and your legs are out that way, you look like a seal. Absolutely, but yeah. that's when you're surfing. When right, we're okay. windsurfing, we're clattering along, we're making too much noise. Right, okay. Surfing, that's really dangerous. Okay. And uh, yeah, I mean, one time I saw a shark. It's close as you are to me. He was right behind me in Hawaii. It's my first day there. I went there a lot, um, like every year. Yeah. But uh, I just landed, and there'd been a lot, lot of rain, and all the runoff, all the soil and mud was in the water, so that when the water's murky, sharks hunt better because you know they can creep up on yeah. you easier. Um, and so I went into this little beach break. It was my first day there. I didn't want to go out in the ocean in big waves. It was too mm. big that day. So I just went in this small break, and right where you, uh, right where you are, like that close, a few <laughs> less than two meters away, yeah. there's the dorsal fin of a shark. And I'm out there on my own, and he's right looking at me, wanting maybe to have a go. And I have to put my hands in the water to paddle. You can't just lie there. Yeah. Uh, that was a scary oh, moment. I actually, geez. I can remember it now, putting my hands in the water yeah. and pulling myself away from him. And yeah. luckily for me, there was a wave like right there, and I was able to catch it and go Jeez. to the beach and warn the other guys who were just about mm. to launch. I like, don't come in. There's here. a lot of different types of sharks out there as well, isn't there? So the white yeah. tip and the black tip are okay. Yeah. You can actually feed them. I know, we used to go and yeah, so slap, slap them, them around. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I remember scuba diving down there once. Well, I yeah. did a night dive. Oh, I wouldn't want to do that. Honestly, I remember going down and all I just kept thinking when I was about 20 meters down or whatever at night in the barrier reef, dun dun. Din, yeah. din, 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 din. You know the old yeah, Jaws film. We, like, we got so shit scared yeah. from that movie, didn't we? So shit scared. Yeah. I won't even let my son watch that now. No, I won't. Him off. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Put him off for life. It put yeah. me off for life. Yeah, I heard Spielberg <laughs> even apologise the other Did day. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I wouldn't do a night no. dive. I would really crap no, it was, myself. It was I, freaky. I find that very ugh. really freaky. Yeah. So so you were going you were going there and tell tell me some other movements you were doing. So were you do, were you putting on events around the world? Yeah. Yeah. So I. After all my windsurfing competitive career, I actually retired when I was 26 mm. because um, uh, really I could see that the sport was really dying. Yeah. You know, it had been such a big free sport. It was the original sort of free sport. And by free sport, I mean like extreme sport or something you do on your own. And then snowboarding was invented and mountain bikes were invented and skateboarding had a resurgence and surfing just went off with new sort of wetsuits and yeah, that's right. development. So all these other things happened. And then kite surfing came around and kite surfing was so much easier than windsurfing that anyone who couldn't make a living out of windsurfing immediately Flipped went to over. Off. Yeah, my, my mate, he what became- What sort of year? What sort of year are we talking for kite surfing, that, roughly? Well, I had my first go kite surfing in 97. And that okay. was when it was just two strings and it was this old thing that if you, it was 50-50 if you're going to die, yeah. <laughs> you tied yourself to it. So just for the listener, just explain mm. kite surfing. Kite surfing is you, you have a kite and everyone knows what a kite mm. is, right? But that, that force in the kite, you would then put a board that feels like a wakeboard yeah. on its edge in the water. And the force of the kite pulling you in one direction, you would resist with your board yeah. in another direction, sort of steer it to to travel across the surface. That was different from windsurfing. Mm. Windsurfing is a sailing sport where your sail is an aerofoil, just like a bird's wing or, or a sailing boat, and your fin is connecting you to the water and driving you forwards, and, and you're on a board, which is basically a non-displacement craft. So it's like a super fast boat. And everything we did windsurfing is true sailing. So when we do a back loop or a forward loop, it is sailing through the air, and any sailors out there listening, Imagine doing jumping your boat up in the air and then sheeting the sail in, which is pulling the power on to force you to go into a forward rotating move. It's shit scary. Yeah. But um, kite surfing, it, it was just like being on a swing, really. It was much, much easier. And it, it, it was different. So as windsurfers, we sort of looked down on kite surfers yeah. a bit. You know, it's, you have you have these things in life and yeah. this ridiculous prejudice we yeah. carry around but <laughs> we had that back then not now kite surfing then became an incredible sport and for the youth and their agility and their somersaults i mean it's just gone nuts yeah. some of the things they do on kites mm. but it was never truly sailing and ours our windsurfing sport we always felt we are the pinnacle of all things sailing you know we really were the it was right on our fingertips mm. and we were holding the sail and the board together we became the chassis of this thing you know the engine is our sail and we drive that engine's power through our body into our board which mm. you know it's bouncing along like wheels on the surface what sort of speed can you get up to on wind surfing? well the world record's about 100 kilometers an hour is that and right? that's an average speed over 500 meters my god yeah it's less if you imagine an olympic size swimming pool 50 meters yeah. less than two seconds to cross the whole pool wow yeah yeah so that puts uh, things in perspective doesn't it or even if you're on a speedboat 
Yes, there's no speedboat would catch us. I'm saying, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're, whenever we, we'd have all the biggest ribs supporting our events. And when we wanted to go fast in rough sea, in rough water, we can do, say, up to about 45 knots, which is about 50, could, something, 50, 50 miles an hour, more yeah, than 50, 50 miles an hour, about yeah, 55 yeah. miles an hour. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and no speedboat in rough water could ever catch us. Yeah. We were the fastest things. Um, so when you so you retired at twenty six, yeah. So, so what was your what were your movements then? How were you earning a pound out? How were you funding your lifestyle? Yeah, well, back until the age of twenty six, I was a professional windsurfer. Mm. So I was paid by sponsors to use their equipment and to test their equipment, not design it, but to test it and work with designers to make sure it was at optimum performance. I could win prize money and stuff like that. And uh, I lived out of my van really, so you know I didn't have many overheads yeah. and I wasn't wealthy but I was earning enough money to get by wealthy and, wealthy in lifestyle yeah, absolutely yeah. and that's what that it's been all, all about day long, right? you know, well I mm. think so same. I have to keep telling myself that same, same. <laughs> but uh, it has been that that's how I've rolled the whole time so but um, so I could see that the sport was dwindling and I'd met this chick in Thailand on some of my travels and um, she was Canadian and back then um, we hung out there for a while and she's very attractive and I wrote her a letter because back then there was no email. Yeah, that's this right, is yeah. like mid nineties or something. Letter facts, facts. I, sent her a yeah. fact. I sent her a letter to her mum's house in Canada. Anyway, she got it a year later and she, then she responded by the latest technology, which might have been facts or something. Yeah. And I said to her, look, I reckon that she was a photographer. I reckon if you join me, I reckon we can say to all these magazines around the world, because there's no internet back then. Mm. Um, and I'd already been writing technique features for the magazine for five years or something. Mm. I reckoned we could do this world tour where we were sponsored to fly anywhere we liked in the world and take photos of each other, like having a laugh. I reckoned it was a <laughs> goer. And in fact, she wrote a book recently and said I was the original Instagrammer because of that concept. Yeah. I mean, obviously I wasn't, but but, uh, but you would have been though. Well, back then because we you're did. getting paid to travel the world, take photos, and send them back so people like us can go. Oh, that's what it looks like out yeah. in yeah. Hawaii or exactly. Venezuela or whatever. Yeah, that's exactly wow. what we did. So for the next that's five years mm. or something, there we were, um, flying around the world, living in New Zealand, living in South Africa, living in Ireland. Everywhere we went, we lived in. You know. We went to Venezuela, and back then there was no no way of really finding, searching the internet for a place to stay. You just had to wing it and yeah. land in Caracas, try not to get murdered, yeah. and find your way to the beach with your gear, and um, meet some people there windsurfing because there was still a lot of people windsurfing mm. then. So you could it's an immediate bond, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly. So you found this friendship, yeah. and then they'd know someone who knew someone in Barbados, and off we went to Barbados from Venezuela somehow on ferries and planes and things. <laughs> And end up in Barbados to this guy called Wolfgang, who someone once knew, and yeah. he's like, "Yeah, okay, yeah, you can stay here." And then we just rocked up, <laughs> and uh, and and it, that was like that. And then he knew someone in Puerto Rico, and off he went to Puerto Rico, and then we were off to New Zealand, and the tourist boards were getting involved, so they were paying us as well. Like, yeah. We went to New Zealand, and we could do anything we liked. They put us in stunt planes, jet boats, really? bungees, you know, the lot. All on a freebie. All on, well, paying us to go yeah. there and and doing it. So. And then, you know, the magazines were paying us for these features and stuff. So. And how were you sending back then? How were you sending the photos back? God, they were on slides. I remember one trip we did to Australia. We'd taken all these photos on slide film. And then I left it. Left all the rolls we'd shot. The old rolls, remember? Yeah, yeah. 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 And I left it on the engine cover of this van we bought in Australia. And they all bloody overheated and got overexposed. Oh, so we, we lost all those. Just but, to um, explain to the mm. listeners who are younger... Oh, yeah. The old camera that you would take, a, you would take the photos. You'd fill up thirty six photos. You'd then take it to the, the, the print place, and you'd have to wait either four hours or eight hours if you paid more. It'd be four hours. And I remember doing going on stag do's and stuff and going, "Oh my god, I don't know what's on that camera roll." <laughs> and you know that the person behind the counter knows exactly what's on that camera roll and they hand them over <laughs> to you, isn't <laughs> it? That fear. <laughs> Sure. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, no! Rip it up quickly. It could be a whole. You know, those people who used to print those must yeah, have a yeah. whole world yeah, of stories. Right. But yeah, so it was slide film, and um, somehow we'd post the slides back to the magazine, which was based in England, the main magazine, the main windsurfing magazine. And uh, I guess then, I think computers were starting. We had this thing called a Scion. It was oh, like this. It was like this tiny little laptop. It was a cross between a Nokia phone and a laptop. Yeah, okay. like. So we must be talking what mid mid nineties. Mid nineties. Yeah, that okay. was when we were really doing a lot of travel. Yeah. And um, yeah. And every month we're in the magazines oh, featured. Yeah. You know, every month there was another feature about 
us two traveling the world. Amazing. It was epic. What's her name? Shauna. Shauna. Yeah. She's wow. Wild, crazy. Is animal. she? Yeah. Was well, she from Canada? She was from Canada. We we got married, separated. Oh, you got married? Too, yeah, I know you? we were not. Did you? Yeah, I didn't know what, what to from get. from a pen pal? Like no, I, wrote... genuine story. I didn't know what to get for a birthday, and I did not want to upset that woman. Yeah. She was. Well, she <laughs> dropped, got a sandy. And I was like, "Fuck! What am I gonna say? Uh, oh, will you marry me? Oh, no! <laughs> no! It was a disaster. But I how long the did how long did that marriage oh, last I don't for? Know. I don't know. How long were you no with? Idea. How long were you years. traveling with her for before you dropped to one day? Um, from probably ninety six to two thousand and three, something. Like oh, okay. That. So yeah. you, you had seven years yeah. booting around the world yeah. and then dropped to one day. Yeah, and we'd yeah, yeah, yeah. And then how long did it last once you once you'd done the deed? Oh, I can't remember. A few years. We okay. had the hell party. That was a great party. That wedding. Everyone remembers that. Where was it? At Kimridge. We rented the land of the house at Kimridge. So. We actually had the whole place. Where's Kimmeridge? Kimmeridge is um, in Dorset, just over the, do you know Lulworth Cove? Oh, Lulworth, okay, Square lovely. Compass Pub, around there, that kind oh, of lovely. neck of the woods, yeah. So that was good. But, um, and no, then and then got, we and lived. Then, and then got divorced? Yeah, we lived in Ireland. We bought a house in Ireland. And in fact, at the time, it was the most expensive house ever sold in Ireland. All the locals could not believe that the house was selling for that much. They thought we were being seen off, but it was because it was <laughs> such... <laughs> the most beautiful place in the world. It's yeah. stunning scenery. It's the second and third highest mountains in Ireland, pouring straight into oh. the sea. Empty waves, which is a surfer's dream. Yeah. You know, you don't want crowds. Dolphins everywhere. Just beautiful. So we bought a house there right on the beach. Of course, we sold it as the most expensive yeah. house ever as well. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it did well. But um, What did you sell it for? Oh, it, We only bought it for like 100 grand or something. We sold it for 200, something like that. Yeah. So I can't remember. But um, we lived there for a while. It was beautiful and flying from there around the world. And then, but then the magazines were sort of beginning to disappear as well because now the internet was yeah, coming out right. yeah. and other things were happening. So we were getting less um, money from magazines that their payment was getting lower. And, you know, we were beginning to realize, shit, I'm not going to be able to actually afford to do this mm. crazy traveling lifestyle. Mm. I've done it for five years like, and we've bought a house off it and all this sort of stuff. And um, so I'd been doing a lot of coaching when I was, just when I left, the, when I was about 19 or 20, I did quite a lot of youth coaching for mm. the other kids. And so I wanted to turn my skills back to that. And um, so, and I knew that coaching could become maybe a lucrative thing. And I knew I enjoyed it. I loved like bringing the best out of people. Yeah. And I loved inspiring them yeah. and, and giving them a good time Empowering and pushing everyone. them a yeah, bit and, yeah. and you know, getting the most out of people who you wouldn't normally think on the surface had much to give and yeah. actually they have a lot to give. Yeah. So that was really enjoyable. I wanted to do that. And um, I can remember I was at Again, the magazines were, were a really good place for me because I was able to put technique features when in you there. you say in the magazines, give me some names of magazines. Oh, well, it was only really the windsurfing yeah, press. Okay. I mean, we did some stuff with other magazines as well, but the windsurfing press, I mean, that was my market. So yeah. there's no point in me being in other stuff, although yeah. we were in other magazines. Those, my audience was the yeah. windsurfing audience. Yeah. And um, I remember being at the boat show in London, which was an annual event, mm. which would be where all the windsurfers from around the country, if not El, Europe. Earl's Court. Earl's Court, yeah. I think it was, yeah. yeah. And um, I was begging people to come on a course of mine for free mm. on a coaching course, and they wouldn't come. So I had no one. I know you like talking about the money in the background and things mm. like that. So I'll just say that at the beginning of this, when I started coaching, I was unable to even attract people, even for free. Mm. But I managed to slowly get some traction and, and, and then they realized actually this guy knows a lot about the sport. Yeah, I'd worked a lot in the development of the yeah. sport so I was able to analyze things and you know, I'm an artist really so I'm creative and I was coming yeah. up with new ideas of how mm -hmm. to present things and have fun with people. And, and um, people started really liking it and within a few years it was getting really good and then I produced this DVD. Um, the DVD was yeah. all the rage back yeah, then. Yeah. Early 2000s? It was, yeah, exactly. It would have mm. been early 2000, about mm. 2004 or five. we mm. actually put it to market and the shops were saying, okay, how much is it going to be? It's going to be like 20 quid or something like that. I was like, no way. This is my knowledge. It's going to be 50 quid. And yeah. They're like, what? Yeah. 50 quid for a DVD? I'm going to laugh, <laughs> mate. No way. Anyway, I put it out at 50 quid and we were the best selling DVD ever, mm. like for Windsor. Mm. And um, as a result, you know, made some good money. But most importantly, demonstrated to a worldwide audience that I knew what I was talking about yeah. in terms of coaching and windsurfing. And so I was able to set up these holidays around the world 
fly to Hawaii every year, get people from all over the world, come in, I'd get 15 guys and girls, you know, every course, and they'd all be same, you know, between 30 and 50 years old. Mm. Windsurfers tend to be quite a wealthy bunch mm. because you need so much determination and dedication mm. to, to get into the sport that that is its, that's the filter. You don't get any, anyone who's not persevering. Yeah. Basically, they're all fucking nutters. Mm. They're nuts. Mm. You know, how, anyone who's windsurfed long enough to be able to come on a course with me, because I didn't teach any beginners, are amazing people yeah. and then you get 15 people it could be from 15 different countries mm. they've never met each other and we all sit around dinner table every That's night quality. every lunch yeah. every breakfast yeah. and we go windsurfing every day and everyone's improving yeah. having the biggest smiles on their faces everyone's having huge emotional trauma as well because yeah. they're not achieving some things that mm. maybe they wanted to and they're upset and then they're elated when mm. they get over that hurdle you know, it's fucking epic. Yeah. But you know what it's like just being with a bunch of randoms. A bunch of mates. Yeah, but, but, but they're then, randoms but, but initially. Random, but it's nothing even, better than meeting exactly. randoms. Exactly, and then they become your mates yeah. and then they start frequenting. And, yeah. and so we're going all over the world with that. And once they'd been once, they'd all come back again. So we were having And that's how you were making like, a living at the time? Yes, yes, okay. yeah. Do you remember how much you were charging them a pop? Well, every course was different. I mean, you know, going to Greece, I do a week in Greece and that's much, much cheaper. The accommodation's cheaper, the equipment rental's cheaper, everything's cheaper. Yeah. Compared with going to Brazil, where the trip is 10 grand now for two weeks yeah. because the flights and the accommodation is off the scale and Mauritius about the same. So, you know, I was, I was earning enough money. I wasn't earning, I mean, I was definitely the one of the highest paid windsurfers in that era, mm. uh, by far the highest paid windsurfing coach, but I still probably was only earning what some half ass tennis coach or golf yeah. coach could get. Yeah, you know, yeah, I wasn't yeah. earning big money at all. But what a lifestyle. What a guy. lifestyle. Jeez. Man. No you know, one's going to take this away from you. No, I know. No I know. one. The memories. No, and also they're yeah. not going to take it away from all the guys who've been. Yeah. Like, all the guests who the come. The knock on effect you've had for their positive yes, they are their lives. happy, happy people. Yeah. I mean, I'm going goosey because I know how much fun. Was there a point when you said, right, I want to go back to pool and settle down? Well, what happened was, after I, I had a summer of love after this split from Shauna, and we had such a good time. And uh, Summer of love? It sounds like about, about 30 years of summer of love, isn't well, it? I have, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and bear in mind, I don't win too well, so I'm always in the sun. <laughs> so <laughs> it's been pretty full on. <laughs> um, so, and then I met this, uh, this girl called Anna. I was at a friend's wedding. He was marrying some supermodel, who was this lovely girl, and... Um, and you know Jordan, Katie Price? Yep. You would have heard of yeah, her. Yeah. yeah, so she was there and all sorts of others. And I was, I was single and I was like, I'm going straight over to sit with those girls. <laughs> and I started chatting to them and Katie was hilarious. And uh, she was like, go on, Anna, he's nice, he's nice. And so on. <laughs> anyway, and I met this girl called Anna and she was gorgeous. And uh, we got on great. And um, actually she was voted FHM sexiest woman in Britain. We got on great and we moved into it together straight away. Well, full in love straight away. Straight away, yeah. everything great. Straight away, started having kids and stuff and it was fantastic. So. And what year, what year are we talking here? How old were you? That was, I was about 34, 35 okay. in around 2004, 2005, something like that. Our first And summer. where was she from? She is from London. Okay. Mm. And what, you settled in London? Or? No, we settled in Brighton, which is where we'd met. And, you know, Brighton's an epic place yeah. to be. So we were there and I was still doing all my traveling. Um, uh now with the coaching courses yeah. and um so but then when she fell pregnant then we decided let's move back to pool to raise kids yeah. just like yeah you know, so many people have done yeah. so back in pool and and actually that's a fairly interesting thing i should mention is moving back to pool obviously i knew the area um but we were looking for a house to buy and i found a house that i thought would be perfect not just as a home mm because it was close to Whitecliffe Park and stuff, mm. but it had a double plot. So the previous owners had already bought the neighbor's garden. So it was a massive garden, Brilliant. you know, it was epic. And so I could see that that was not just a um, decent home, but that was a business opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. So we bought this and I had to fight tooth and nail for that. You know, this is a classic when someone gives you no for an answer, mm. it means no yeah. to them, not to yeah. you. Not yet. You crack on. Not exactly. Yeah. And it fell through and developers were trying to buy it and it went on and on. But eventually I managed to persuade them to sell it to us. And they were very kindly did um, for slightly less money than they would have sold us elsewhere. But anyway, then we had this house with a double plot. It was a perfect family home for the young kids. And, but then I bought, when the neighbor's property came up for sale, I bought that. Mm. 
So yeah. just for the listeners here, yeah. you're talking like half a mile from Sandbanks. Yes. Well, I mean, it's a bit more. It's nowhere near like Sandbanks pricing. No, it's not. I'm saying just for the location wise, so people can understand. Yeah. On the south coast here, you've got Sandbanks and it's literally probably a mile away from that. Exactly. It is a mile away. And we could see the sea from the windows. Yeah. So in a beautiful place, perfect area with kids play park and all that kind of stuff. You could walk to school, all these things. But then the neighbor's house came up for sale. I mean, I to be honest, I persuaded them to sell it to us and then the next <laughs> neighbours and so on. So we'd sell our house, keep the garden, buy the neighbour's house and now we'd have a triple plot and we did that down the street until we had five of them and then by that time, 15 years had passed or whatever. But then, um, you know, because I wasn't earning that much money windsurfing really, I was just having the most amazing lifestyle. Yeah. That I knew in the background I kind of needed something else and I always had it that one day I'm going to be able to sell all this land yeah for a building project and sure enough I got planning permission and managed to get four houses on the back of it and sell that for a, an enormous sum of money which basically f- powered our our life and it, it, it actually doubled our wealth yeah. and and we did that sale just before we got divorced so we were able to amicably well uh-huh. not really amicably but we were able to <laughs> s- split and how long were you together for Oh, I'm not very good for years. I don't know, 15, 10, 10 15 20. years. And what, you had one kid? <laughs> no, we had three boys. Oh, you got three, three boys? Three lovely boys, yeah. Oh, all wow. epic. Rocco, How old are they today? Today, Rocco is seven, uh, 16, um, Diggory is 14, and Ozzy is 11. Quality names. Yeah, they're quality boys. Yeah. All very different. Yeah. Love them to And bits. do they live with you? They live with me as much as I possibly could get them to live with me, but mm. that's not as often as I'd like. Yeah. You know, it's never, it was a separated parent. It's it's very difficult. I think normally, especially for the men, yeah. that we lose our children and, and the, you know, it's been a major event in my life, losing my children, not being able to wake up with them every day. Mm put them to bed all these things just generally having them around and being there as a as as your genetic role to protect them you know it's really ugly and it got me very you know i went downhill a lot when i after the divorce because um i just wasn't spending the time with my children that i wanted Mm. to be and you know after divorce there is a lot of animosity and the ex wasn't facilitating enough of time with the kids as I would have liked but equally the kids were really young and they needed their mum so it was tough and then with me traveling a lot that that, it was a tough tough time after that what do you mean you said you went downhill well I it all after the the, so the divorce was probably about five years ago say approximately and I I decided that I would study matrimonial law to represent myself in this divorce case because I didn't want two solicitors who's you know, solicitors get off on mm. being able to exploit grey areas mm. and push each other. What else are they going to get off? All they do is sit in an office every day. Yeah. So they, no offence, solicitors. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. but, you know, you, you get off on exploiting grey areas and trying to win one over. And uh, the guy I was up against was a corporate lawyer who my mate used to use as a bulldog, he used to call him. He was like a battering ram in corporate law. And now he's a fucking divorce lawyer. Oh, no. So he just had an awful reputation, uh, reputation around here. Um, I say awful as in from a male perspective yeah. for the women he was winning loads of money and stuff yeah. like that and he was a, a tricky one so anyway I studied matrimonial law because him against another solicitor they had been fighting and costing everyone a fortune yeah. so anyway I studied matrimonial law and represented myself to keep a lid on it and we managed to keep a lid on it um, in fact what I'd offered Anna 18 months before the actual court date is what she got mm. so we managed to keep it relatively good. Why did you split up? Well, you know, I think these days I mean, we grew apart. We grew apart. We, it was tough. You know, it's tough having kids, as you know. And um, you know, they can be ill and they can be have their own challenges, and that takes a lot of the the time and your energy away from each other, but to look after the child. And our first two were a little ill when they were young, quite ill actually, and. Um, and that really set, you know, it was really tough for Anna, mm. really tough. She was working so hard to look after the children. And I was often away earning, you know, the money. Um, and so when I came back, I wanted to just, you know, I'd come back and fully clothed, just get in the bath with them. She'd be like, why are you in the bath with your clothes and your mm. shoes on? And, you know, <laughs> I was like, it's fun, <laughs> you know, and I'd start taking over and I'd want to think. And she actually, she actually said it really well. It's like whenever I came home, she'd been the captain of the ship. 
and I was now coming home and I wanted to be the captain yeah. of the ship and I wanted to do this with the kids. Yeah. And she, you know, as a single mum when I'm away, mm. she was having to be really protective of yeah. them and look after them. And when I came back, I wanted to throw them in the Fun mud. Fun time Frankie. Wasn't yeah, it? yeah, exactly. But I think so that's the same with every dad who loses their kids or the, the wife takes the kids you come back you want to be front time frankie you want to be the fun bus yes the whole time yeah and that's very true and then also when when you become the fun bus a little bit yeah. and and she becomes a bit protective yeah. then you push your yeah, i yeah. want to push it more i want to be even more fun yeah. and then she needs to be even more careful and we end up in this huge crevice between yeah. us and we don't see eye to eye and stuff so we just drifted apart we, we became different people as we mature and and I, you know, I wanted to do lead a certain lifestyle, and mm. she wanted to lead a certain lifestyle, and they weren't compatible. We were arguing and all those kind of things. Yeah. And I actually thought that it would be much better if the kids could. I wanted them to see more love between mm. two parents. Uh, so I wanted to find a new partner who I could love and demonstrate that in front of them. Mm. Um, and I wanted them to. I wanted more influence over their life. Yeah. Would so you? Would you? <laughs> would you? Um, when you look back, would you have any regrets representing yourself, knowing what you know now? Um, no, uh, no, not in terms of um, dealing with the uh, separation and the financial se settlement, but it did take its toll on me personally, because, you know, admin's not my thing, it never has been. I'm bright enough to work things out, but uh, I was never into it. And um, so studying that was fucking ball like. But, um, and you just studied it just so you could represent yourself. Yeah, it's not that hard. It's you know, it's but British you're against, If you're going system. against like a, a bulldog lawyer, like you say, is yeah. it? and then you're representing yourself, representing yourself as a surfer dude, yeah. enjoying life and everything's easy come, easy go type thing. All of a sudden, you're sitting there stressing yourself out trying to learn yeah. law. Surely that's a mad, mad it idea. It was a mad right? thing to do. Yeah. It was, but uh, overall, I mean, it saved a little bit of money potentially, but we don't know how out of hand it would have got otherwise without me keeping a lid on it. And, and I had a PA who was a dear friend of Anna's, so the whole time throughout the divorce one of Anna's best mates was my PA so that, that <laughs> so was she good. was given the in, was she given the inside info well we had to because that way I kept my integrity and yeah. I wanted that I didn't want to become a cunt like yeah. like, like yeah. screw her she's the mother of my kids yeah. so the money she was going to get was going to go to my kids mm. so it's fine you know mm. it was just about getting it right and making sure they were set up we were set up mm. and everything so um fair play to you by the way yeah, well, yeah. It, it worked out well in the end, but it causes a lot of problems. You know, yeah. you get all these, all her mates think I'm a bastard yeah. and all this sort of stuff and all these things. So Were you? No, I wasn't. You were just a, just a front time Frankie, enjoying life. Oh, well, that side of it. Oh, no, well, then I, I you know, well, <laughs> I was partying a lot. I was yeah. having a lot of fun. So that's a <laughs> there different There we story. go. That's a different story. Come on, Yeah, well, well, you know, at the end of a relationship, the relationship had broken down. Yeah. And then, and then you know, at the end of the relationship. But yeah. I was, a, I was when I'm in a relationship, I'm really... Um, you know, I had I've had three long term relationships mm. and recently another. That's where in my life I've basically had three long term relationships. Mm. In between those relationships, amazing like party, yeah. shag fest, you yeah. know how it is. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but in the relationship, was, I was always good mm. until the end of the relationship. Mm. And then when all the cracks are there and it's yeah, definitely on bitter. a well, and when it's downhill, then I'm gone. Yeah. So, did it affect your mental health? Yes, absolutely. It, it did. In yeah. which way? Um, I would say that I had depression after the, the divorce and I didn't know that because it's not something you invite upon yourself yeah. you don't notice it because you're not blowing your nose or yeah. something but looking back at it and realizing uh, a number of personality traits and feelings I had I definitely had some depression after the divorce mm. at the time it sort of disguised a bit because having done all that um, uh, study and work and I had paperwork everywhere and I was on my computer the whole time it was not the life I wanted no. to lead when I finished the divorce case I shut my computer lid and I said I'm never answering another email again and for five years I didn't answer an email good for you so all my guests well, it was good but it wasn't good for business no. so all my guests were like hey where the fuck is Kribi gone mm. and now they couldn't reach me I just could not bring myself yeah. to do any emailing or anything and so in retrospect, that wasn't just me being a, like sad about, you know, or spending too much time yeah. on the divorce. It was because I got some level of depression, not yeah. deep depression. I was able to still have fun and things, but, and I haven't, you know, I haven't been diagnosed with this. This is just a self-realization yeah. on reflection that, wow, I was in a pretty bad place there. 
you know, I wasn't seeing my kids as much as I'd like to. That's the heartbreaking oh, bit, isn't man, it? It's horrific. Like, I see friends going through it now. It's yeah, just like I, everyone I meet, like they, they reckon 50% of people get divorced. That's a high percentage. Mm. And you see mm. the pain that the dad goes through. I can mm. only speak on the dad side, but yeah, I've never exactly. been divorced. I will, I'm talking yeah. about other yeah. friends of mine. Yeah. It's awful to see, yeah. and everyone I've, every one of those dads you meet, they all say never, ever, ever get divorced. Yeah, they also normally they, say yeah. never stay with a psycho, but then that's <laughs> <laughs> that's, <laughs> but, but, but that's that's just a perspective. Yeah, no, but, it, it yeah and Anna yeah. wasn't a psycho. I'm not saying that. <laughs> um, Shauna was. <laughs> but uh, do you do you, do you have an effect on women turning into a different woman than when you first met them? Oh crikey. Did someone ask you to say that? No. <laughs> Does no. every woman ever I've ever met ask you to say that? I definitely do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And unfortunately, but I think that is just, that is the nature of a relationship. When you relate to someone and you have a relationship, you do, you know, influence each other hugely, yeah. chemically, biologically, yeah. mentally, everything changes in your life. And so, yes, I've absolutely had an effect on women. Mm -hmm. And there's no question that trying to partner me with all my traveling and stuff, yeah. and I like to party and yeah. you know throw shapes and all this sort of stuff, you know. And if it's windy, I'm not going to go to the, see a sister today. I'm going to go <laughs> windsurfing. So I am not an easy partner, yeah. you know. Yeah. I'll admit. So yeah. yes, I would have been traumatic to. And is it, do you reckon it's taken you these 50 years to realise you're an easy partner? Yeah. Have you got another? Have you got another more love to give to a new partner? Do you think? Absolutely. Yeah. And and you know what? Um, it has taken 50 years to realise this, and it's because. You know, I was a cocky little shit when I was at school, and and then, you know, I had some successes, and with the competitions and the, you know, people applauding me along yeah. the way, it, pe you know, when you're winning stuff or doing well, mm. you've got sponsors, you've got people smiling at you, mm. you get applauded. And then I was in the, I was in the magazines for 25 years every month, something like that, and so I had all sorts of people always applauding my successes mm. and saying, oh, you're a great guy, you're great. Um, and then the coaching, wow! I mean, if there's ever a way of getting appraisal and mm gratif you know yeah. self yeah. or love from others it's that it was amazing what we were sharing with the guys and watching them develop as people and as windsurfers was just amazing so i often ha i had that all my life these yeah. people saying wow guy thank you did thank that you. create arrogance yeah absolutely yeah. well actually no i, I don't think or was, winning mentality it, well quickly on the arrogance thing i for sure i've had some moments where i would have been arrogant yeah. in my life for sure but in general uh, and I'm an egotist and stuff, and I have grandiosity and all these things, but um, not really detrimental, not not in a bad way. I don't have prejudice or or uh, things. I'm pretty level. I'm, I like to think I'm level-headed, yeah. pragmatic, and uh, I enjoy people's company. So I wouldn't say I was arrogant in many ways. I've seen and been around a lot more arrogant people and mm. felt uncomfortable with it. And um, so no, but on a but I'm stubborn mm. and I am pleased with some of the things I've achieved and yeah, but I wouldn't say I was arrogant. Mm. And what's, what's your day to day <laughs> like now? Where are you living today? Now I live not far from here. I've walked to this podcast yeah. um, and day to day. I mean, today I'm getting on a train from here and going to see my girlfriend and then I'm flying out tomorrow morning to Foot Aventura to my house out there and in the winters, because of COVID, COVID fucked everything up, yeah. right? My business was a travel business. Yeah. I was coaching people around the world and COVID stopped that dead. And on top of that, I didn't get any money from the government mm. to support me because I had such a weird job and I was a director of this company, then then I didn't get anything. So I spent all my savings to get through COVID. Um, I had some amazing times. I did a lot with the British sailing team and helped the, the new generation of British windsurfers and that was an awesome experience. Mm. And and I could talk about that for hours, mm. just that. Um, but my business model, which was travel, was screwed. Yeah. And because I haven't been answering emails or doing anything, it was beginning to kind of <laughs> slow down a lot yeah. anyway, because I used to have, every course used to be fully booked with a waiting yeah. list. But when you don't have any advertising, any marketing. Yeah. And I, you close I, your laptop for five years. Close my laptop, yeah. didn't do anything for the magazine, so yeah. I had no advertising. All I had was like these guys going, hang on, we've got his old secretary's phone number, let's give her a call. And it, the courses were still working. Yeah. So I was like, why would I do any admin mm. when I, it's still working? Mm. But then COVID really put the nail in it and, I, and I'd and i lost a lot of traction. So my day-to-day -day lifestyle at the moment, or life, is uh, I do have some courses coming up in 
I've got courses in Mauritius and Brazil and Greece, possibly Morocco. I'm not going to go to Hawaii this year for the first time in decades. Um, although people, are, maybe I will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but day to day, I, I, I get up early. I love waking up super early. Um, I'm uh, going to go to Fortaventura now to surf on foils. And where is Fortaventura? It's in the Canary Islands. It's yeah. off the coast of Morocco. It's sort of south. And we were chatting Morocco. a couple of weeks ago. That's and right. And you said, like, I'm sitting here in 23, 24 degrees. Yeah. <laughs> Hang on, I've just got to slurp my yeah. tea. Are you saying that's the best place to be for winter? If you want to be in Europe, yeah. at least politically in Europe, yeah. then the Canary Islands is the most southern European country destination so when i fly to fuerto it's like four hours directly south and it was when we were chatting it was mm. like minus something here Here it was freezing and i was in I was 25 like, degrees board shorts. yeah mm. i was like mate this is I'm not yeah. this one up. and it's only four hours away so we, yeah. we bought that house as a family place to bring the kids because uh, you know three little boys i wanted them in the sun in the winters yeah. and it was affordable and and uh so that was a great place to mm. go. I mean, there's Barbados where you visit, mm. much further on the flight, yeah. but it's a beautiful oh, place. Man. I love it. I love, love it. it. Love so, um, you know, as long as you fly south in the winter, you're going to be okay. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. If you were to wave a magic wand, which country would you live in for the rest of your life? Oh, man, that's an impossible question because bear in mind, I've lived in all these different places, and every time I travel, I feel like I'm living there. I really have never considered that I would only ever lead a life where I was transient I'm a hunter gatherer at heart yeah, still yeah. you know I just want to move around and mm. see reap the benefits of the seasons and the weather and the waves and the people so I couldn't really answer that sorry but if you had to pick one country which would it be fuck I have no idea I mean I just just it's like I'll pick I, one I can't. I'm never in one long enough to. I mean, I I appreciate that. The Your next thirty years, you're only allowed in one country. This is not going to happen. <laughs> it's hypothetical. It's not going to happen. I, I I like too many places too much. I mean, I like a mix of city life. I've had some amazing city experiences, and um, mixed with ocean life, nature. I mean, nature's the big thing. So really, it's got to be nature, um, and because of the nature I like with big waves and clear water and sea life. We're, we're getting warmer. Yeah, we're yeah. getting warmer, come on. Good. But the thing is, you can't get nature, everything in one. sea life, sun. Oh, I have to say, my recent favorite has been Mauritius, but that's purely because of the waves, not because of the country. Yeah. So it's this, this is reef off Mauritius. Is that video I said? Yeah. I mean, that, that's that was just a cracking. Just to, just to give people a heads up there, just tell someone, tell the listeners here about foiling okay so i'm glad you got onto this yeah so this because you sent me that video i was <clears> like oh <throat> my god that's like a, a whole new sport right it is a yeah. whole new sport absolutely I explain mean, foiling right so hydrofoiling mm. has just taken over all the water sports it's what you see in the america's cup and the sail gp um and in windsurfing it's the next olympic class as it is in kite surfing a hydrofoil is basically a underwater aeroplane mm. so you've got this aeroplane and the way aeroplanes fly is if they go along fast they lift and this thing is underwater and we're attached to it by this carbon stick so to someone on the beach it just looks like we're standing on this board hovering above the surface yeah. but there's this carbon stick going underneath to an underwater airplane that is flying and we are basically standing on the back of this thing flying around like standing on the roof of an airplane flying yeah. around and whatever movement we make affects this hydrofoil underwater and there's and it's so much smaller than a board or boat that there's hardly any friction so it's so fast and it never slows down and you can point it in any direction. And it's fucking yeah. amazing. And then the sensation, the actual, I mean, regardless of the fact that it's opened so many new doors in water sports mm. and sailing sports. So it's a, it's a surfboard still, but it gets raised up how high out of the water? About a meter. So About a meter at the water. Yeah, yeah. And what are you holding onto to move? Well, anything. You can, hold, you can hold a wing. This is the new version of it. It's just got this inflatable lilo, it looks like. You just hold on to that, and, and that gets you going. And once you're going, it needs so little power to keep it going. We can have an e-foil, which is a battery-operated one. You just pull a trigger, and you're... And yeah, then you've got the windsurfing ones, which are doing like 40, 40 miles an hour, and they don't have brakes. When we go windsurfing, the Olympic class yeah. is the most nuts sailing sport we've ever seen. Yeah. 
I did some of their world championships in COVID time. Mm. And we'd have like 200 people at a regatta, 100 people on start line, all skimming each other. It's like starting <laughs> a marathon race. Imagine looking yeah. at the marathon. But everyone's flying along on these swords. We're balancing on these swords, doing 30 miles an hour, neck and neck, yeah. and they're razor sharp. <laughs> It's the most lethal yeah. fucking thing I've ever seen. It's so scary. Yeah. Your adrenaline's just off the scale yeah. the whole time. So, but hydrofonia, this the sensation. You're being lifted up all the time, and it's this this real pressure that is pushing you up. It feels like pussy. Yeah, it feels like <laughs> pussy, man. Honestly, I'm telling you. You know when you slide in and you get that hot, warm that pressure. It feels like that the oh, whole God. time. Yeah. it's unreal. We're all frothing about it. Wow. You like talk to anyone who's been hydrofoining, and they're just like they can't stop talking is about it. Honestly, <laughs> <laughs> definitely gonna have to check that out, Dan. <laughs> where, where, um, guy, where can people find you? Uh, guy Crib on um, Instagram, which is at G U Y C R I B B. Yeah. But you know, I don't really post anything. I yeah. haven't posted there for a month. Sometimes I post a few things. Sometimes mm. I don't. Do right now, what, I haven't bothered. Do you know what? I found this really fascinating. Very different to what we what routes have gone down. I've really enjoyed your company for this hour, and I really appreciate your honesty. Thanks, man. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. You've made yeah. me feel very comfortable. And Good. I'd recommend anyone to come along and do it. And yeah. yeah. You've certainly you. lived an eventful life. I have. I and know. I can tell with that glint in your eye, you've got another 30, 40 years of still gallivanting around the world. <laughs> <laughs> You're an absolute gentleman, Guy. Thank, Thank you so you much so for coming much, on. Man. And Thanks I wish so you all much. the best in the Thanks, future. Brother. Good really man. I really appreciate this. Thank Good you. man. Thank Cheers, Guy.